Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. The federal government has not done enough to address the ongoing water crisis in many First Nations across Canada. That's according to a new report from the Auditor General released today. The report examined how far federal funding has gone to eliminate long-term boil water advisories since the Liberal government came into power in 2015. And findings suggest the feds were never on track to reach its 2021 goal long before the pandemic hit last year. Brittany Hobson explains. The Auditor General of Canada says unless significant changes are made in how the federal government works with First Nations to resolve water issues, problems with access to safe drinking water will persist. A new report states Justin Trudeau's government has not provided necessary support to end long-term boil water advisories and address ongoing water issues in communities. In, in a country like Canada in 2021, uh, it is hard to believe that there are so many individuals who don't have access to something that many of us take for granted. Um, and hence, it, it is time for um, Indigenous Services Canada to, to take some concrete action. Karen Hogan called the findings disheartening. The report tracks what has been done since 2015, when Trudeau came into power, until late 2020. The Liberals promised to end long-term boil water advisories by March 2021. They have confirmed this will not happen, citing delays due to the pandemic. But the Auditor General found Indigenous Services Canada was not on track to meet this deadline prior to the pandemic. In 2015, there were 160 long-term drinking water advisories. As of November 2020, 100 have been eliminated. However, the report finds 15% of these were resolved due to interim measures. There are many temporary measures that are put into place. And a temporary measure uh, just pushes the issue a little further down the road. So it is time to find long-term sustainable solutions for the First Nations communities. While there are some plans in place, or, or under development, um, those solutions won't be in place until at least 2025. The audit found the department's efforts have been constrained by an outdated funding formula for operations and management. Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller would not give a time frame when the AG's recommendations would be implemented. I have a very, very specific goal of ensuring that clean water gets in communities. We have to make sure that it's being done in the right way. And I, I would put to you that we are, we are close to getting there. We are, we are on a good track. Ultimately, the audit found a regulatory regime was still not in place. 15 years after the AG first recommended it. The report says until this is implemented, First Nations will not have drinking water protections comparable with other communities. Brittany Hobson, APTN National News. And you can find much more on the Auditor General's report over on our website, aptnnews.ca. When he was named Quebec's anti-racism minister on Wednesday, Benoit Charette said education reform was at the top of his list and with good timing. By Thursday, a group of Indigenous students from Bishop's University went public with allegations of discrimination and mistreatment on campus. Lindsay Richardson has that story. The, the 2020 Bishop's Indian University Indian. Convocation Address referred to right. a need for change. Bishop's is far from reflecting the diversity of Canada in its students, staff, faculty, administrators and governors. Five months later, a group of Indigenous students say their attempts to see change through didn't fare well on campus. There was a lot of eye rolling and there was a lot of um, negative tones in the way they were uh, responding to our questions. You know, it's been a battle to try to express our needs as First Nations. When we try to help, we are looked down upon, we're downgraded. These women are part of an Indigenous cultural alliance at the Sherbrooke-based university, located about two hours east of Montreal. With the help of the Center for Research Action on Race Relations, or CRAR, they made their concerns public, saying an on-campus diversity task force is whitewashed. Indigenous professors are underrepresented. The university's land acknowledgement is insensitive. And their promised $6 million cultural hub for Indigenous students is slowly being co-opted for office space. We were told that we can't get everything that we want. We've had a lot of comments about how um, we should be grateful for even getting a space 
Cassie Pearley says she was retaliated against for pointing out mistakes in course material. I had a teacher who was mispronouncing, misspelling a lot of the indigenous stuff. I would, I sent him an email and trying to help him out and I was downgraded for it and I was singled out in class. I was not given homework back. I was, he would purposely fail me and stuff due to this thing. And even when I brought it up to other people's attention, nothing was done. So they proposed having elders come and speak instead and were told if it wasn't free, it couldn't happen. We would love to have so many speakers, but like, we just don't have the budget for that. And um, it's not like Bishops is throwing money to help us get these speakers. Bishops must do better. In reaction, Bishop says they're committed to diversity and inclusion and are now recruiting a special advisor to address both. But these students feel a first step is acknowledging that systemic change is a two-way street. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Montreal. Well, time now for a quick break, but stick around. There's much more to come. Welcome back. February is Black History Month, and it's being observed in Iqaluit, which some might not know is quite a multicultural community. Our Ken Driscoll spent some time with an Iqaluit playwright who is black, Enoch, and growing more successful by the day. Mioli Koli Sudlubnik is a product of Iqaluit. This is a big week for the playwright. Her contribution to a national project called 21 Black Futures premiered online over the weekend. Koli Sudlovnik is black and Inuk, and so is the lead character of her play. I called it Black Berries, and the, there's a young girl, fictional character, who travels north for a relative's funeral, and while she's up here, she has an opportunity to get out on the land and, um, and chat with her cousin, who is uh, somebody that she's that's helping her to identify herself through just herself expressing uh, to her cousins. Only 1% of all Nunavumiut are black. Over 80% of all Nunavumiut are Inuk. Being both, Koli Suglubnik faced different challenges than many kids in Nunavut. And she put that into her art. I draw on some of my own experiences uh, through things that either I've lived or that I've seen and um, but Effie is somebody who grew up in the south whereas I grew up here in Iqaluit and having grown up here in Iqaluit uh, there's a lot of assumptions about what it means to be black in the north and that possibly I was you know I'm from somewhere else I often get the question of um, you know where are you from but where are you really from she is really really from Iqaluit and so is her mother when Koli Sudlovnik was growing up in Iqaluit in the 80s, her mom treated her just like her other kids, with one exception that will be all too familiar to parents of black children. I, I think the, the only uh, difference I saw in Mira when she was growing up, and I think one of the hardest times was combing her hair, because <laughs> it was curly, and if it was long, you know, I, I, I had to be careful that I wasn't hurting her as much. But she probably, re you know, has stories with that too, but, and making sure that she wasn't late for school. But otherwise she was, you know, another child at home. Her father, Audley Coley, is from Jamaica, grew up in Toronto, and now lives in Montreal. It isn't hard to tell how proud he is of her. My daughter, I'm like, I'm so proud of her to, to see the, it, the person she's developed as. Okay, because I can only give her my view as um, uh, as a black man, as a Jamaican, but with Jamaican background. But her mother does like an amazing work from the Inuit perspective. So um, e even though we might not be together um, as a couple, my daughter is the benefactor of, of like two incredible people. Because Miali's dad says that when he first moved to Iqaluit in 1978, there were only five other black people living in Iqaluit. He can still name them all. This was the scene last year at the Black Lives Matter protests held in Iqaluit after the death of George Floyd. And that's a whole lot more than five black people out there, side by side with Inuit. 
Kolisa Lubnik has a unique point of view with a foot in both worlds, and by sharing that through her writing, can help the territory learn and grow. Kent Driscoll, EPTN National News, Halloween. To the East Coast now, we're under the guidance of Mi'kmaq artist Alan Sillyboy. Mi'kmaq youth are learning their culture hands-on. They're painting a boat that will eventually be on display in a Halifax museum. Angel Moore brings us that story. Students at Pecto Landing First Nation are painting this boat with Mi'kmaq petroglyphs. Petroglyphs are rock carvings estimated to be older than European contact. The eight-pointed star is one of many petroglyphs that are located at historic sites in Nova Scotia. Grade 8 student Ethan Francis says painting them on the boat links the community to the past. A lot of our culture was lost like a long time ago and petroglyphs are from like ways to show how it was and like it's almost like stories being told from ancestors. Kaylin Hammond, a grade 7 student, draws to share history. And yeah, we need to know how they lived and so that people know the truth about them. Mi'kmaq artist Alan Sillyboy says the eight-pointed star represents the Mi'kmaq universe and will be at the center of the boat. Petroglyphs feature prominently in Sillyboy's paintings. They're an inspiration he hopes to pass on to the youth. And so, you know, learning about them and expanding on them is really being my life's work. So, you know, it's important that every child knows, knows about uh, petroglyphs and who left them. Teacher Haley Bernard combines Mi'kmaq culture with education. Like I, I didn't have the opportunity to learn this as a student in school ever, any cultural or language. Once completed, the boat will be on display at the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic. Angel Moore, APTN, National News, Picto Landing, First Nation. Looks pretty good. Well, host Todd Lamarand will be here with the latest episode of Nation to Nation after the national news. Here he is now, though, with a look at what's coming up. Tonight on Nation to Nation, I speak to Justice Minister David Lametti. Last week, he introduced legislation that wants to do away with some mandatory minimum sentences. Lametti says it's to undo Stephen Harper's tough-on-crime program. It, it's a failure. It has been a failure. It's been demonstrated to be a failure. It's led to the, the massive overrepresentation of uh, Indigenous and, and uh, Black people in our criminal justice system. I also talked to preeminent scholar on Indigenous law, Dr. John Boros. He'd like to shake up the Supreme Court of Canada, expand it from nine to 12 justices, with those additional three being experts on Indigenous law. That's coming up in a matter of moments. I'll see you then. Looks good as always. Well, we've got to step aside for one more quick break, but stick around. There's much more to come. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. Sent in by Melvin Morasti Jr. His father, Melvin Morasti Sr., set up a little backyard hockey rink I wouldn't call that little, but uh, this rink is outfitted with little hockey nets and lots of lights for nighttime skating. Coming by, Melvin. That's a beautiful looking rink. Thanks for sharing. Uh, are you enjoying the last weeks of winter? If so, you can send us your pictures to share at aptn.ca for a chance to be featured. Hope Melvin's rink doesn't melt away. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the east coast, minus one with snow for St. John's, three below and flurries in Halifax, 16 below with snow for Nain and Kujuac. Minus four under sunny skies for Montreal and Shibugamu. Plus four in Toronto, plus four in Sault Ste. Marie with snow. Three above in Thunder Bay with snow, plus one and flurries for Sioux Lookout. Minus five with snow for God's Lake, three below and snow in Norway House. Plus two with flurries for Winnipeg, zero and flurries in Brandon. Zero with flurries for Regina, minus six and snow in Saskatoon. Minus one with snow for Meadow Lake, 27 below for Stony Rapids. 
Over to northern Alberta, minus 24 for Fort Chip, 19 below in Fort McMurray. Plus 2 in Medicine Hat and Lethbridge, minus 5 for Edmonton. 10 above in Victoria, sunny and 8 for Vancouver. 0 and snow in Prince George, plus 2 with snow for Smithers. Minus 28 in Old Crow, 5 below for Whitehorse. Minus 30 in Yellowknife, 29 below for Norman Wells. Minus 27 and snow in Saks Harbor, 35 below for Colville Lake. Minus 36 in Cambridge Bay, 39 below in Whale Cove. Minus 33 for Resolute, 40 below in Joe Haven. The biggest fish plant in the Northwest Territories is open this winter for the first time in 15 years. Our reporter Charlotte Moore Jacobs takes us to Hay River to look into what's needed for the industry to become a year-round viable source of revenue. Six miles from shore is where Marius McCullum makes a living. He's been commercially fishing the waters of Great Slave Lake, Northwest Territories, since the 1970s. I got lots of customers. Providence, Fort Simpson, Gin River Everest. Fishing expertise aside, McCallum credits his success to setting his own prices as a business owner. And for the last 12 years, he's been able to process and keep his commercial catch in the north, selling to restaurants and private customers. In the winter, it's a lonely job because his small fish plant on his property is the only one operating in Hay River. The big commercial fish plant where most fishers take product to has been closed in the winter for years. McCallum says he's witnessed a decline in the NWT fishing industry. This place was full of fishermen when I first came here. Freshwater had a big boat here, a freighter boat. We used to carry 2,000 boxes of fish. Yeah, it used to go around Marine Bay, Wool Bay, and uh, for, uh, Simpson Islands and back here. Used to make two, three trips a, a week. Never stopped. Fewer fishers spent less product. In 2005, the Hay River fish plant, owned by Freshwater, a crown corporation based in Winnipeg, began closing each winter season. Until now. As APTN reported in July, Indigenous Fishing Cooperative, Tucho, took over management of this Hay River fish plant, and a new fish plant is expected to be built and operational by 2022. In the new plant, Tucho will process, market, and set the price of product, instead of sending their fish down to Winnipeg to be processed and sold. This winter, Tucho has supported training in communities around Great Slave Lake. Robert Bouchard, a business advisor for Tucho, says the cooperative isn't waiting until the new plant is built to attract more fishers to the industry. I mean, the viability is a question mark for sure, but right now it's just a catalyst to get it going. Like, no one's geared up for winter anymore. There's only, there's only a handful of people that have bombardiers and have the capability and the training to do it. Bouchard says there's lots of fishers out there. Now, it's a matter of getting them to increase their catch. There's some people that are just doing sustainability fishing, so they're just feeding their family and some friends. But maybe if there's a place where they can drop their fish off readily, they'll they'll do more. Like they'll do they'll put in ten nets, and then they'll make a little revenue. So, and then that person builds to a certain point, right? And then now you have people that are wanting to buy new boats, new equipment. The next step before the fish plant opens, strategizing. There's six pieces of fish in there. I sell them for thirty bucks. How to set the best price? diversify products, and grow market shares for NWT Fish. Charlotte Mort Jacobs, APTN National News, Hay River. In a Canadian first, a 300-kilometer long river in Quebec has received legal personhood, a status that will protect it from potential exploitation by hydro companies. The Magpie River on Inu territory is known for salmon fishing and rafting. Previous attempts to protect the site were blocked by Hydro-Quebec because of its power potential. So the Inu Council of Iquaniset and municipal leaders in Mangani passed parallel resolutions to give the river nine legal rights, 
similar to humans. They will be appointing river guardians to protect the magpie in and out of court. For me, it's always been like that. It's always been like that for all the nation. The nature is alive. You can see there are movements, listen to the rivers, listen to the trees. On se rejoint de plus en plus. C'est ça, je pense que le message aussi est important. In recent years, Yukon First Nations have severely restricted Chinook salmon harvesting due to low fish numbers. Now, a recent study has found only a third of tagged Upper Yukon River Chinook salmon are making it past the White Horse fish ladder. Every year, the salmon travel 3,000 kilometers from Alaska to spawning grounds in the Yukon. In order to make it upstream to spawn, the fish must get past a 15-meter high fish ladder near Whitehorse. The study found that last year, only around 220 fish passed the ladder out of an estimated 650 fish. One of the things that could be impacting um, salmon passage at the ladder is the fact that um, these salmon have traveled 3,000 kilometers upstream by the time they hit this, this dam and fish ladder. So it's um, a rather unique um, migration challenge that not many other uh, salmon populations on earth have to face. It's uncommon to have to do such a long migration and then um, have this challenge of passing a dam. In better news, with the help of Blackfoot elders, a herd of bison were reintroduced to Waterton National Park in southern Alberta. Elders from Kainai, Siksika and Pekani provided blessings and held a ceremony to honor the herd of six. The park in Treaty 7 territory has been without bison since a wildfire in 2017. Leroy Little Bear of the Kainai Nation has been working with Parks Canada as part of a uh, bison restoration project. He says the bison alters the landscape by bringing other animals and plants to the region. So it's been something that was a dream of our elders to bring those buffalo back. It's also very important with regard to our culture, our songs, our stories. How beautiful were those shots with the mountains in the background? Well, that is all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Thursday. For news anytime, you can visit our website, aptnnews.ca, and never miss a headline by downloading the APTN News app. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for tuning in. Stick around. Todd's up next with Nation to Nation. Have a great night.